All right, so as I mentioned previously, this is going to be our last um, chapter for a while in the book of Psalms. We'll come back to it, of course, because we didn't finish the entire book. I just, after 50 weeks of Psalms, they're great. I love them. Um, it's just, you know, it's the longest book, 150 weeks in a row. It's kind of a long time. I kind of want to split it up a little bit and, and come back to the Psalms uh, after we do some other books for a while. But, uh, man, I've, I've been loving all of these. They've been great, packed full of great doctrine. So we're going to close out uh, for a little while on Psalm 50 tonight. Let's go ahead and jump right in to verse number one. The Bible reads, The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. So here we just see this great language of just God basically speaking to the earth and speaking to the inhabitants of the earth and his voice just going forth into the earth, out of Zion, of course, I believe out of, out of the heavenly Jerusalem, out of the heavenly Zion, the perfection of beauty, God is shining, and the Bible saying, you know, he's not going to keep silence, a fire shall devour before him. And, of course, we already read the entire chapter, but there's a lot of talk of coming judgment, of things that are not good, which is why it even starts to bring up here, a fire is going to devour before him. And the fact that it brings up in verse 3 that he's not going to keep silence. See, oftentimes people confuse uh, the long-suffering and mercy of God with just God not caring or God not being there or not being a big deal or whatever things are going on. And don't doubt that God will not keep silence forever. Right? God's not just going to hold his peace as wickedness increases and increases and increases because God is the judge of the whole earth. Right, and, and this psalm in particular is, is not necessarily one of just, you know, joyfulness in, in general as far as the, um, you know, the, the, the tone of the psalm and the song. It, it's a lot of, of warning of judgment to come and not just warning to the earth in general. We started off with just God, you know, speaking to the earth. But look what it says in verse number four, and it reiterates the same, the, you know, the same subject matter, the, the, the target, the object group, uh, as it does in verse four, where it says, He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. We want God judging his people. Right? Not just all the wicked nations of the earth and all the unbelievers and everything. This is talking about God judging his people. Look at verse number five. The Bible says, Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God. Even thy God. And you know, God's people oftentimes need to be reminded who God is. Where God says, you know what, I am God, even thy God. Right? Don't get too relaxed and slack and get off into wickedness and thinking that, oh, everything's just fine. Oh, God's blessing us. Oh, we're so prosperous. Oh, everything's so good. Hey, don't forget who God is because God is judge. Where it says here, God is judge himself. Right? You're not the judge. I'm not the judge. God's the judge. And he is going to judge. And he's a righteous judge. And there's a fire that's going forth before him. And be sure that God is not mocked. And be sure that God will judge his people. Keep your place here and turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to start reading in verse number 23. Bible reads, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said... Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. A reminder, again, of who God is. And in Hebrews 10, don't be deceived. This isn't talking about unbelievers. I know there's some language in here that might get some people confused, but it's not that confusing when you read it through and read it in context and think about it. This is talking about people who are saved. Okay, and we're going to go through this just real briefly about this judgment and fiery indignation that we need to be aware of because God will judge His people. If you are born again, if you are saved because you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are of the seed of Abraham, spiritually. You are of Israel. You are one of God's people. You are a child of God. You are His people. So when we read these passages about the Lord shall judge His people, especially in these contexts, because obviously sometimes you could be looking at it and going, it's talking about the nation of Israel being His people. And oftentimes you can you know, spiritualize that in many senses, if it's depending on the context, if it's taking place in the Old Testament, and He's referring to His people, and you can, you can see that He's referring to them um, not just as a nation, but as, you know, as his chosen people to do things. Um, it, it could be representative also, or, or it could be applied to any believer, anyone who's saved, any group of people are saved being his people. Obviously, you got to be careful in the context, but in this context, we're going to look at this again and go through this again and see that this is very clearly talking about people who are believers needing to, to be mindful of the fact that God is a judge and it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Okay, it's, it's, it's something that we need to take heed to because vengeance belongs unto God. He's going to repay. He's going to revenge. When we do things that are wrong, you better believe that God will make it right. Now, thank God, we don't have to worry about the wrath of God in the lake of fire. Right? Thank God for that. But that's not the only uh, um, output of God's anger. Right? That's, not, that's not the only thing that God can do is throw people into hell when he gets angry with people. There is judgment. There is punishment. There are things that we need to be aware of and take heed to. As a child with a father, we need to beware and, not, uh, and tread lightly when it comes to how we live and how we act and our obedience unto the Lord. Let's go back up here in Hebrews chapter 10. because And I you know, we read this context talking about basically going to church and considering one another and provoking unto love and the good works in verse number 24. In verse number 25, excuse me, continuing that same thought saying not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Right? That would be not going to the assembly of believers, which is church. The church is a congregation of believers. That's exactly what that is. As the manner of some is. So do some people do this? Yeah. Were some people doing this back in the day? You better, you better believe it. I mean, it's, of course they have been. People still do this today. They think church isn't that important or, or you know, I can't, there's no church that I can go to. Look, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort one another. One of the reasons for coming to church is to get that exhortation from other people and the encouragement, the edification that you're going to get by being around other believers. 
It's a dark world out there. There's a lot of wickedness out there. And if you allow yourselves just to be exposed only to wicked people and the world and just worldly people and everything of the world, that's going to have an impact on you. And if you're never surrounding yourself and assembling yourselves with believers, with people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that have the same spirit, that are the same kindred as you, as you spiritually, it's going to have a big impact on you and how you live. So God's saying, look, this is important. And there's many other reasons. I'm not getting into all the reasons why you know, going to church is important. But what I want to point about this passage is that he, right after he brings up not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together and exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So as we get closer and closer to the return of Jesus Christ, to, to the Antichrist coming in power, to all these things that are going to happen and come to pass, as we see the day approaching, it's so much more important to not forsake the assembling. It's so, that's why we're not you know, just going and running off into the hills and just saying, okay, everyone, things are getting real bad. Let's just go bug out and go hide out and, and you have your place and you have your, you know. No, we need so much more to be gathering together as we see the day approaching. But then it follows up this same exact thought in verse 26 for this conjunction of four, if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So sinning willfully, there's many ways you could sin willfully, but the last one that's just mentioned would be forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. But what we need to understand also about the book of Hebrews in general as a whole, this is giving a lot of information about the differences between the way, uh, the old, basically between the Old Testament and New Testament. Because this is a book written specifically to Hebrews, to people who were physically of Israel, people who had been worshiping in the synagogues and, you know, bringing in their animal sacrifices and, and observing those ordinances, the carnal ordinances. And, and Hebrews kind of explains why there's a change. It gives you the, the understanding to be able to make all the appropriate applications of what's changed because of the, the change in the order of the priesthood from the order of Aaron to the order of Melchizedek with Jesus. Christ being the high priest, and that's why there's a change in the way that things are done, right? There's many chapters discussing that in the book of Hebrews, but one of the things it brings up now is that because we're not under that system of law anymore, that, that, that Mosaic law, right? I'm not saying that, that God's laws are just null and void, but there's a lot of things that you don't do anymore, specifically with the sacrifices. And now what were the sacrifices for? You have a lot of sin sacrifices, right? There's, there's, um, if you, if you had a, if you transgress against God's law, then you'd have to come and bring a sacrifice that made things right with God. Now that never saved your soul. Hebrews deals with that. I don't believe that it just, you know, that, you know, oh, in the old Testament, they needed to do these sacrifices in order for the soul to go to heaven. That was never the case. The blood of bulls and of goats was never able to save. That's never been it. It's always been a picture of our Savior Jesus Christ. But what it did do, though, was keep people in a good standing with God where they could show their repentance. They could show that they, you know, their, um, their heart to God saying, you know what? I've done wrong. So here's my sacrifice, Lord. And it was a way that God prescribed. And it was a way that you can get right with God. Those sacrifices are done away. So what this is saying here is, is if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. You can't just go now and, and kill a bullock and bring it to the temple, you know, bring it to the bullock to the temple and have it, have it cut and have it offered and, and, and make this sacrifice for your sins. It says, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. Now, people get confused about this. Oh, it says fiery there. That must mean hell. You could, have, you could have fiery indignation, just like you could have a fervent spirit in your heart without it being talking about hell. Or you could pray earnestly or fervently, and it doesn't mean that it's, that it's just talking about you know, the, the, the place of judgment of hell. So we're, we have a certain fearful looking for of judgment, fire, and indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. And it says in verse 28, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now, that's true, right? If people would, would commit many acts 
you know, that, that was uh, under the Moses law, it would require the death penalty. Or if they didn't listen to the judges and the judgment, right, if they despised Moses' law, that was a death penalty also. If they just refused, like, nope, not going to listen to it at all. It says here that they died without mercy. Of course, you needed two or three witnesses. But it says in verse 29, of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. So he's saying basically how much worse is it when you're just taking the sacrifice that the Son of God made and, and it says, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. And that's how we know it's talking about saved people because it's talking about someone who is sanctified. So you are sanctified. Sanctified means you're set apart. It means you're made clean. You are, you're, you're washed in that blood. The blood that Jesus Christ shed for you, you were sanctified, but now you're treating that as if it's some unholy thing. As if it's not very special. As if it's not holy and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. He's saying, you know, people died under the Old Testament law without mercy when they despise the law, how much worse is that when you willfully just sin against the Lord and just say, nope, not going to do it. Yes, you have the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, but what do you, how are you treating that sacrifice that he made when you're just choosing to say, no, I'm going to sin anyways. You're saying, I don't care what Jesus did for me. That's not that big of a deal because I'm just going to go ahead and sin and do whatever anyways. That is a, is a serious uh, offense in God's eyes, and, it, and that's where we get the warning, for we know him that said, that said, vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense that the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So just because you're saved doesn't mean you have this license to sin. And this is what people have a problem with that don't believe in eternal security because you have fools out there that believe in this hyper grace that think that, oh, we just can't sin anymore. And there's, you know, nothing is, is bad and you could do whatever and basically treat it like we might as well sin that grace may abound. Right. Where the Bible teaches, God forbid. Or the Bible teaches, no, you respect the Lord. You still follow His commands. You, you know, it should give you more reason even to follow His commands. You're not trusting in that to be saved, but you're going, hey, I want to serve the Lord. I'm thankful for what He's done for me. I'm going to listen to Him. I'm going to obey Him, and I'm going to respect Him, and I'm going to listen to what He has to say instead of being disrespectful, disobedient, trodden underfoot the Son of God, and knowing what's right from wrong and still going, you know what, I'm going to do this anyways because I just want to. That shows zero respect for the Lord, for what Jesus did for you, for that sacrifice. You're basically just treading, you might as well just be stomping on Jesus' face. When he did everything that he did for you and you just go ahead and say, you know what, I'm just going to sin anyways. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Flip over a little bit, a few pages of 1 Peter chapter 4. The world needs to know who God is, but you know what? God's people need to know who God is, too, because He is the judge. 1 Peter chapter 4, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glory... glory excuse me, glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come... That judgment must begin at the house of God. So you know what? The time has come for judgment to begin right here. Right at the house of God. Right in the church. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? You're saying if it's going to be, you know, if we're looking for judgment for us, how much worse is it going to be for those that aren't even saved, for those outside, you know, how much wrath is there going to be? It says, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. 
we need to make sure that we're keeping our souls dedicated to the Lord as unto a faithful creator because judgment will begin at the house of God. And you know what? We're held to a higher standard. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought to hold ourselves to a higher standard as well of, of you know, hey, there's been much given unto us, so much is going to be required. Amen. And that's a very biblical concept that's, that Jesus himself said, that you know, unto whom much is given shall much be required. You've been given a lot. Not even just with your salvation, but with the words of God being preserved for you, being readily available, having all the conveniences that we have today to be able to hear preaching, to be able to get to church, to be able to do all these things, and to be able to come to church more frequently. You know, back in Israel in the Old Testament... They weren't just able to go to church every week. When they lived in a much more agrarian society and you didn't have all the, the, the things at your disposal, I mean, obviously there's animals and stuff to be able to ride on, but you know, it's not like you're just, you know, oh, we're just going from one state to another just to go to church. Right? That was, that was not happening. The distances that people could travel now to come to church every single week or even multiple times a week, that would never happen back in the day. You weren't able to do that. I mean, that's why they were able to bring, they, they bring their tithe in, like, you know, after three years, they'd be going and making journeys and bringing in, you know, bringing in their substance and, and you know, honoring the Lord that way and doing those things. It was not something, um, you know, obviously you could meet together or whatever in local groups, but still not, um, it's, it wasn't the same at all. Not even close. We've been given a lot. We have a lot of opportunity. So let's not uh, neglect that. And, you know, in, in the spirit of Hebrews chapter 10, too, you know, I, I know people make a lot of sacrifices, but I, it's worth it to even make the midweek service. Yeah. Right. And I, and I know that it's sometimes just not physically possible for some people to get here. I mean, I get that, but we still should be doing our best to make the sacrifices because so much more as we see the day approaching, we need to be encouraging one another, edifying one another, and, um, and continuing forward. Let's go back to Psalm chapter 50. Cannot lose sight. With all the love, gentleness, goodness, faith that comes from the Lord, all the goodness of, of God, don't ever forget that He's also the judge. He's also uh, uh, will chasten every son that He receives. And that, that vengeance belongs unto Him. He'll repay. Don't allow yourself to get that wicked heart, the wicked attitude that just says, well, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. That's going to be contrary to what God says to do. Look at verse number 8. Bible reads, I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? God's explaining here the sacrifices, right? Because we were talking about how people, when they would sin, they transgress, they bring sacrifices, offer unto God. But he's explaining, as he's done many times in the Old Testament, what he wants, it's not that he wants these animals being offered to him like he needs you to go out and kill an animal for him and shed this blood. And he's saying, I'm not even going to reprove you for basically not doing the sacrifice and burnt offerings continually before me. So I'm not even going to reprove you for that. Because that's not what he's really interested in. Now, as part of the law, they should have been doing these things, but that's not what he's looking at and what he's really focused on and what he cares the most about, because what he cares about is the heart. What he cares about is you, and he cares about your obedience. He cares about you listening to him. He cares about you trusting in him and relying on him. That's what he cares about. He cares about you. He cares about your soul. He cares about you know, your heart. And he's saying, I'm not going to take a bullock out of your house 
or the he, you know, says, I'm not going to take this substance away from you. He says, it's all mine anyways. <laughs> I'm the creator of all this stuff. The whole world belongs to me. Right? God has ownership over everything in the world. You think you own what you have? You know what? God owns what you have. Right. And we need to have the humble attitude that understands that instead of getting lifted up in ourselves thinking, oh, oh look at how much I've accumulated under myself. You know what? That's all God's. He's the original owner of everything. He blesses people and lets people have some things and maybe some people more than others or whatever, right, as he, as he chooses. But don't ever start thinking that this is, you know, that all this stuff is mine. It's God's. God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. It's a, those are his. He lets us be stewards of, of his property. Right. And we could keep his creation and what he did. He's given us dominion over, over many things, but we don't own it. When you die, you're not taking away a piece of land with you. Going, <laughs> you're, not, you're not taking a, a piece of property or anything or animal, anything that you said, any substance that you own. It's not going with you. Amen. You were just caring for those things for a while. It all belongs to the Lord. It's all His. And he's, he's saying here, you know, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. I don't need anything from you. You're my creation. If the world's mine in the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Now, that is what people are commanded to offer. But he's saying, I don't need that. There's a, there's a whole other purpose for doing that. It's not because God has need of anything from you. So we can't miss the point. I should have had you keep your... I forgot to... I meant to even put that in my notes. Keep your place in Hebrews 10 when we moved away from there. Go back to Hebrews 10 because this also um, covers the same, the same subject about the, you know, the, the blood of bulls and goats. God did not command to give sacrifices because He needs it. He doesn't need anything from you. Hebrews 10, verse number 4. The Bible reads, For it is not possible, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Now, this is something I, I think this is great to highlight in, in your Bible or make a note of. If you ever run across someone who believes in dispensationalism, where they believe people got saved differently in the Old Testament versus the New Testament, there's a, there's a lot of people that buy into this teaching out there. This is a great verse to show people. I remember showing someone I was on an airplane once, and I think this guy was saved, but he was just kind of confused because he'd been taught a certain way. And, you know, I struck up this conversation, and I started showing, and I showed him Hebrews 10, and I'm like, look, I mean, the Bible clearly says it's just not even possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. So how could people in the Old Testament have their sins taken away and be purified by offering up these sacrifices in the Old Testament. It never did save them. It was never capable of doing it. You think a bull or a goat? You think that Jesus is just like a bull or a goat? That, well, the bull and the goat was able to, well, he's just able to take away once for all, but those blood, you know, the bulls and the goats actually were able to do it for, the, I mean, look, for any amount of time, it's never able to take away your sins. The, the, the bull and the goat, or whatever animal. It's not possible. Verse 5 says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Again, saying the same exact thing we're seeing in Psalm 50, God doesn't really care about those sacrifices. And, you know, I've said this multiple times, don't get focused on the big sacrifice that you can make for God. You know, whether it be some financial thing, so, oh man, I'm going to make this big. Be more concerned about your obedience and hearing the Lord. Because that's what He really cares about. God doesn't need your big money financial contribution. He doesn't need it. Now, there's nothing wrong with a free will offering. It was part of God's plan also, right? If you, if you want to give something to the Lord, you know, He'll appreciate your, the sentiment. 
but don't get so focused on those physical things, on those offerings and those sacrifices, because at the end of the day, there's something way more important. Let's keep reading Hebrews 10. Verse 7 says, Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will. O oh God, he taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Go back, if you would, to Psalm 50. God's way more interested in you doing his will. Following his commandments, listening to him, taking the instruction from the Lord. That's what he wants. Verse number 14 in Psalm 50 then continue, you know, ex explains what God is looking for from man. Verse number 14 says, Offer unto God thanksgiving. So you want to make an offering? How about you offer thanksgiving? How about you be humble? How about you be thankful for what God has done for you? That's what God's looking for from you. That's the offering he wants to hear. How about pay your vows? And pay thy vows unto the Most High. How about you say you're going to do something? Why don't you just keep your word? Because God treats your word as being very high or valuable or precious. You ought to keep your word the same way. It's the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay, that's a pretty, uh, there's a lot of trust that needs to be put in the word of God. You're trusting your entire soul to the word of God. So keeping your word important for, to God, in God's eyes, keeping his word is, is everything in a sense, right? I mean, it's so important. We need to keep our word too. You're going to make a, a promise. You're going to make a vow. You're going to represent, you know, Jesus Christ here on the earth. Hey, God keeps his promises. God keeps his vows. You better keep your vows too. You make a vow unto the Lord. That's a big deal. How about you pay your vows? And God's not even saying you have to vow anything. He says better not to vow than to vow and not pay. See, so just don't even do it. You're better off. But if you're going to make a vow, you better keep it. You better treat that seriously because you open up your mouth before the Lord. You better show respect unto God that you don't just speak flippantly and loosely, but you're going to pay your vows. And then verse number 15 says, And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. God wants you to give your thanks Pay your vows. You say you're going to do something, you do it. And you know what? Rely on Him. Trust Him. Call on Him. You're having problems? Go to God. Amen. Just rely on Him. He likes that. He wants that. He wants to be glory. Look, if you just, you know, whatever the problem is, whatever the turmoil is, whatever's going on in your life, you say, God, help me. And then when He sees you through, you can glorify Him. Because that brings glory unto the Lord when you need help from Him and He can step in and help you. Have that faith, though. Be, be, be more concerned about having the right heart, having the right attitude, and having the right reliance on the Lord than about some animal sacrifice or some financial gift or whatever it is, right? That's what God cares more about because he doesn't need anything from you. But what he likes to see is when we realize we need him. And, and we, we stay in our place and recognize him for who he is and that he's the judge and that he's almighty and he doesn't need anything from us. So how about we start relying on him. Let's let him lead our paths. Let's let, let's let him direct our way and let's give thanks unto him who owns everything in the world anyways for anything that he decides to give unto us. Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above from the Father of lights. Okay? He gives unto us. We, you know, the things that we receive, hey, praise God for that. That's why we tithe on all of our increase. Because we're showing God the respect of, hey, thanks for blessing me. Thanks for giving me this. Right. Here you go. I'm going to show that respect. Is it because God needs that tithe? God needs that money to do... God doesn't need it. But it's us showing our obedience and thanks to God. Amen. 
This, this, these two verses here in Psalm 50, verses 14 and 15, the thanksgiving, the paying of vows, and calling on the Lord in your time of trouble, it's actually really interesting. It's found a few times in Scripture, these three things all packed together in, the same, in a similar context. Jonah's another place. This You don't have to turn there. Turn if you would to Psalm 116, because we see it in one, Psalm 116. But Jonah's another example. The Bible says in Jonah chapter 2, verse number 9, this is almost at the end of the chapter after Jonah's swallowed by the whale, right? He's been in the whale's belly and he's just about to be vomited out of the whale's belly. In verse number nine, he says, but I will sacrifice unto thee. So says, I will sacrifice unto thee, right? Psalm 50 was talking about the sacrifices, but not being so worried about the animal sacrifice. He says, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. All three things in one verse in the life of Jonah saying, you know what, I'm going to give me thankful unto you. Now he had to go through some hard times, right? God had to judge Jonah who had turned from the will of the Lord, who was running away from God, who was trying to do everything not to do the will of the Lord. And he was brought into some real serious turmoil being in a whale's belly. Okay, that's not fun. And I've gone over this before where you start really trying to realize it and think like what it would really be like <laughs> in a whale's belly. Not, not, not anything I would ever want to even come close to knowing fully what it's about. The stench, the dead stuff in a whale's belly that just is, you know, being decomposing or being consumed by acids, stomach acids, whatever, you know, all whatever's going on in the digestive system of a whale. Darkness, stink, no fresh air. I mean, yeah. And then just being in like liquid, you know, just no. I mean, it's bad enough to be like shipwrecked or something, but yeah. So yeah, he went through <laughs> he went through some serious chastening of the Lord, but then it got him right. But then he realized, you know what? I'm going to give the sacrifice of, with the voice of thanksgiving unto God. I'm going to pay that I vowed. Okay, I made a promise unto God. I'm going to keep that vow. Salvations of the Lord. I'm relying on Him. He's going to deliver. And then you know what happens in the next verse? The whale vomits him out. That's what he wanted. God wasn't looking for Jonah to just, okay, well, I did this. Now I guess I got to offer up this bullock, right? And just have an attitude like that or whatever. Like, like Catholics have the attitude of just, well, I sinned this week, so I'm just going to go and I'm going to go ahead and, and do my penance and, and confess to a priest and whatever, how many prayers I have to say, whatever, you know. And they don't really care, right? Just like, well, this is something I got to do. That's never what the sacrifices for the Lord was ever about. It's not what it's about. And he doesn't want people getting focused on that level of like, like he, he wants true repentance. He wants your heart. Psalm 116, look at verse number 12. The Bible reads, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? He says, What can I give God for after all he's benefited me? Verse 13, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly, I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. Look at verse number 17. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. We see this, like I said, a few times in Scripture. It's bringing up this same pattern of paying your vows, relying on the Lord, salvations of the Lord, trusting in Him in your day of trouble, um, and offering up the, the being thankful. Right? That's the offering. That's what He's looking for. That sacrifice of thanksgiving. Let's go back to Psalm 50. So we contrast that, that right heart, that right spirit, that right repentance that God's really looking for with verse 16. 
It says, But unto the wicked, God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth, seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee? Now, turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 2. And, you know, this passage can be, these verses can be applied multiple ways. I, you know, one says, unto the wicked. You can apply that to just really wicked, unsaved people, right? But I don't, I, I still see, I think it's more applicable applying it to people who are wicked that are still saved, right? That are treating the Word of God, you know, because the, the opening of Psalm 50 is, is, you know, talking about His people and judgment and everything else. And, you know, people who are saved can do wicked things. People who are saved can willfully sin, like Hebrews 10 is talking about, and can tre tread underfoot the Son of God, and can do despite unto the Spirit of grace. You know, the Bible talks about, you know, the Bible says grieve not the Spirit. You know what that means? It's possible to grieve the Spirit if you're saved. It's possible to do all It's possible to do wicked things. And what this is talking about is a person who's a total hypocrite. Right? Because he's saying, why has the, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes? So why are you talking about my laws? Or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth. Why are you even bringing up this stuff? You're doing wickedness, seeing thou hatest instruction and castest my words behind thee. You don't have any real regard for my words, so why are you even using them for anything? This is the same attitude we see in Romans chapter 2, verse number 1, where the Bible says, uh, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. Romans chapter 2 is talking about the man who's basically doing the same things. It's the hypocrite. Right? It's a person who they want to judge other people on what they're doing and they do the exact same things. And that's what the Bible talks about over and over and over again about the unrighteous judgment. So even in Matthew 7 when it says, Judge not, they be not judged, it's not talking about you could never ever say anything judgmental to anyone ever. But if you're doing the very same things that you're going to judge someone else about, you better be careful about that because guess what? You're going to be judged too. If they're going to be judged, you're going to be judged. Because you know what? In that, in, in that sense, the law is blind, right? If, if someone's going to be judged for doing something wicked and wrong, they're going to be, you know, every, anyone will be judged for that. You don't got to be, um, you know, God's not a respecter of persons. And God actually hates it when he sees people going, you know, pointing the finger when they're guilty of the very same things themselves. Judgment comes upon the people of God. It came upon King David. Do you remember when, uh, when Nathan the prophet came unto him and he told him that whole story, right, about, about the the. the, the goat that was, you know, like a family member. And then the rich man who had all his goods decided to kill that one for, for the friend that came and visited. And what did David say? Oh yeah, man, that, that guy needs to be put to death. Right? He was quick to make the judgment on that and he, you know, you're that guy. That's you. And you know what? David was judged by God you know, severely. Now, God showed mercy on him and didn't take his life. And that's a great mercy. But he was still judged. But he was, a, he was a child of God. And you know what, though? He repented. And he really was. He really was grieved and sorry for what he had done. 
and, and it really did make an impact on him. And it wasn't just because he got caught. He literally repented and, and got his heart right with the Lord. Now, I mean, for some people, it takes being caught sometimes to get to that point. But some people, they don't really, they're not really upset by what they did. They just wish they hadn't gotten caught. There's a difference. There's a difference between the two. David humbled himself and completely recognized and repented from what he had done that was wrong. Whereas some people will just, they'll say some of the right things, but they're really just upset and they would do it again in a heartbeat if they could get away with it. Two different things. But either way, God's the judge. Right? And we need to be aware of that and not be hypocrites in our own life. And especially if you're going to go spouting off about the law of the Lord and everything, you know, you better make sure that, that you're not guilty of the thing, very things that you're talking about because hate, God hates that. Look at, uh, go back to Psalm 50. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Verse number 18, the Bible says, When thou sawest a thief, <coughs> then thou consentedst with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. Verse 21, These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. And this is, goes back to kind of the original opening statement about God speaking to the war, uh, to the earth and saying that he wasn't going to keep silence, right? That there comes a time where, where God has long suffering. And when God sees this, he sees someone out here, go, you know, claiming God's law and all this stuff and judging. And, and then he's there with the thief. He's the adulterer. He's doing all these wicked things. And just giving this, you know, trying to sound like this real holy person, but inwardly is just wicked as hell. And he says, These things I was done, and I kept silence, though thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. God's saying, you know what, but I'm going to come and judge. You think that I've just been quiet this whole time? And because, see, people get away with some sins, like this person right here. They're still going to play the act and say and, and let people think how holy they are because they're quoting God's law and they're, they're, they're promoting God's word. And then it's like they're a thief. They're an adulterer. They're doing all these wicked things. In their mind, when, as they get away with things, they're going to start thinking like, oh, see, I must, I must be right with God. I'm so holy. You know, they, they deceive themselves into thinking that they're like that. God is some respecter of persons and you know this must be how God is like it's, it's, it's weird it's twisted right but what, the more people get into sin the more blinded I think they get especially you get full of pride where it's just like any, you know, people are just thinking like how could anyone even think that way being guilty of all these sins but, but people who get into really, like, in, get really wicked into all the sin their mind gets, gets darkened they just get blinded to a lot of things. And, and I think because people are always trying to justify themselves, this is one of the ways. And the only reason I even know that that must be going on in people's minds, one, I've talked to somebody who is guilty of a lot of really weird things, really bad things, I should say, and they said some, some weird things to me, kind of justifying their actions and talking about how easy it was to, you know, like... That was a, a that that was one thing, but above that personal communication I've had with someone who was actually just like like really into a lot of sin that would be completely exactly like this person being described right here in Psalm 50, being a thief, an adulterer, you know, but still going up and spouting off the word of God and the commandments and everything else. The Bible says, thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. I mean, God's saying that, that this person who's acting this way and doing these things is thinking these things. And all I'm saying is that this is why I know that that's what's going on in their heads. But I've also talked to someone that I wouldn't be surprised if he thought the same exact thoughts based on what I've heard. 
He says, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. He's saying, you know what? You are going to be shown that you're wrong and you're going to see when I set things in order. Verse 22, now consider this, ye that forget God. Says, consider this. Lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Yes, God is love. Yes, God is long-suffering and merciful. But don't ever forget that God is capable of tearing people in pieces. And he's saying, you know what? You better watch out. Don't forget. God is the judge himself. God's not to be trifled with and messed with and fooled with. He's a serious God. Because if God decides to tear you in pieces, none's, no one's going to be able to deliver you. Verse 23, Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. So I'll show you my salvation. But order your conversation aright. And again, I've, I've talked about this before. Conversation is an old word. It's not just talking about like communication and how you speak. It's the way that you carry yourself. It's the way that you live. It, it's, it's more about who you are and what you do than it is about what necessarily, specifically, what's coming out of your mouth. Great reminder in this. I mean, I love our hymns, too. Like, I love the hymns. There's so much good doctrine there. But even the hymns are kind of lopsided. On, on the content and what they're about, right? They're not fully balanced like the Psalms are. I mean, the Psalms, we've already seen a lot that, that are just great on, on being extremely edifying and encouraging and uplifting and motivating. But there's also quite a few with warnings, serious warnings and, and teaching of who God is. And we need both. We, we need to know that God is a judge and he's going to discipline and punish and he's going to judge his people just as much as we need to know that he is there for us and he wants us to come to him and he's got open arms and he's merciful and, and long-suffering and he gives blessings. You know, we need it both. We need the encouragement and we also need to be kept in line. So let's take that away. Don't forget that God is judge. And you know what? Apply this psalm. Don't be thinking about other people. Apply this to yourself. In, in whatever capacity it fits. Because to some degree, it's going to apply to everybody. Knowing that you know, God is judge. Remind ourselves of that. And um, you know, even not outside of Psalm 50, you know, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of of a living God. And, and, you know, God is not mocked and He is a judge. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You so much for the instruction that You give us and the, the words of life and, and how highly You've regarded Your Word and kept them for us today. I pray that You would please help us to, to ever live more closely accordingly to, to Your words and that, and that You would guide us and, and give us understanding and knowledge. And uh, Lord, help us to be able to clean up our lives so that we wouldn't be, you know, hypocrites in your eyes and, and that we would be able to be able to judge righteously because we're not um, we're not guilty of the things that that we believe in and that and that um, that we trying to teach and be a good example on others. Lord, I pray that you please just just strengthen us, strengthen our faith, uh, strengthen our spirit, dear Lord, uh, weaken our flesh. And, um, and, and help us to mortify the deeds of our flesh that we could just grow stronger and stronger in spirit. And uh, Lord, lead us, guide us, build our church. Lord, help us to reach more people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.